Hello, I'm Vivian de Dunbar. Welcome to planning your fleece to frock fiber project. I started this uh, this class because I've tried to do a project where I started with a raw fleece and then tried to go all the way through everything to the finished project and it's a very overwhelming task. It's something that takes a long time and it's very helpful to break it up into smaller chunks and um, and I've I've done it the wrong way a lot of times, and so hopefully I can help you uh, do do a good job of getting your project together. So let's just dive right in. What I'd like to cover in this class is how to plan and execute a successful fleece to frock project, important project details to consider, so things that you may not think about. Um, this is going to depend a lot on what you're planning to do with your project. We'll get into all those details. And I'd like for you to learn from my past mistakes. Uh, I like to do everything the hard way. And hopefully some of the things that I've done, you can learn from that and not have to go through uh, the, same, the same trouble. The first thing, the most important thing with any arts and science project that you're doing is to do your research up front. Um, this will give you a better idea of how to proceed. It, if you research as you go, you may be going along and then find out that something you did is not compatible with a later step, or you were doing it completely wrong, or there was an easier way you could have done it. Um, you may find that there is a better or more period or easier way to perform a task. You may also, in doing your research, find someone else who's done a similar project, and then you can learn from what they've done and not have to start uh, you know, all over from the beginning. And when you're doing your research, keep a list of your sources and page numbers, because um, as this is a big project, usually it takes, it's over a course of, of many years that I've do, done some of these projects, and trying to remember what book something came from and what page number that I researched a year or more before is just uh, not possible. So, you know, try and keep keep that all, however you keep it, keep a list of your pages and your sources. I have in the uh, section on handouts, I have a project checklist for you. So you can go ahead and take a look at that and you can change it to meet your needs. But the I always try and do a checklist before I start, um, before I even start the research for a project. The checklist will let you know what areas will require you to research. Um, it will give you a list, you you'll make a list of materials that you'll need for the project. And then this way you can determine what you have, what you still need, what you might need to make, what you might need to purchase, or what you might be able to borrow. Um, and the checklist can also help you answer questionnaires if you're gonna be entering your project into an arts and science competition. The checklist will help answer some of the questions that you may be faced with. So now let's get into the actual planning of your project. The first thing you're going to want to do is choose your garment. Uh, are you going to be using a piece that you have an extant piece of clothing from, or are you going to use a picture that was painted or an illumination? What time period is it going to be from? Is What region of the world is it going to be from? What is the status of the person that's wearing it? And what will you be doing while wearing it? These are all decisions that you should think about, and it will really affect what your final garment will look like. What color will your garment be? Are you making or purchasing the pattern? Will it require a lining? Or will you be making the lining? Or will you be using fabric that you purchased? And what embellishments will you need? Will you need buttons, lacing, trim? All these things you should think about before you even start working on the project. So here I have some pictures of different uh, garments ideas. So I'm currently working on a fleece to frock project where I'm going to be taking Jacob sheep fleece and doing color work because a Jacob sheep has like a brown black wool and has white wool all on the same sheep. So I'm going to do brown, the brown, black, white, and then I'm going to mix it together and be gray. And this way I can do color work without dyeing it. So all the way on the left-hand side, I have a picture of an extant garment that has the kind of color work plaid that I wanna do. So this is really helpful because I have an extant piece. I can get a lot of information about 
uh, what the weave pattern is, if it was how it was spun, um, the thickness of the, the, the yarn. So all of those things, if I want to do it exactly like this, I have all that information. Now the middle picture is uh, from an illumination and I had made a dre this a dress very similar to this for a, the Welsh event that Mistress Karis ran a couple of years back. So now this doesn't tell me what kind of fabric was used or what the weaving pattern was. All of those decisions I had to make on my own. Uh, the only thing was I had a, a fabric that was similar in color. So that was really the cut and the fabric color is what I got out of this. So it would require more research for me to do um, to determine all the other the other elements of the dress. And then on the most right hand side, this is an extant piece of a sleeve, again, from the time period I want to make my dress from. And it has the, the color work plaid, uh, but it also shows you buttons and buttonholes. So this is a good example of how those embellishments could be used. So all of this information um, are things that you can use and will help you determine how your, pro your finished garment is going to be manufactured. So now that you've decided what garment you're going to be making, now it's time to decide what kind of fiber you're going to use. Uh, what, fi what fabric is typically used in the style of dress? What fibers would have been available to that region and at that time period that you're making your dress? What fibers do you have available to you? And how much are you willing to spend on the project? These are very important because while you, the dress, if it's an extant dress, um, it might have been made from a sheep that doesn't exist anymore or something that just is impossible for you to get, um, that it's so rare or just so expensive to get it shipped to you that it's that it's prohibitive. So the, like I said, I'm going to be using Jacob fleece for my dress. And while that's not technically a period sheep, the American Jacob sheep breeders have been breeding the sheep to look like the period uh, Syrian sheep that we see on pottery. So to me, it's acceptable to use because it, it's a recreation breed. Also, I live in the modern area of New Jersey and we have many Jacob sheep breeders. So medieval people would generally use sheep that were local to them unless they were paying a large sum to get imported, imported fibers. Um, so I'm going to be doing something that's a local sheep to me and is something that's ready, readily available. So here I have some pictures. This is how I choose to document the fibers that I'm using. The picture on the left-hand side is information that I've gotten from breeders that when I have gone to the fiber festivals in my local area, I take their information and put that with the rest of my documentation. It also gives me the name and address of the, of the breeders. And on the right-hand side, I have a picture of all the fiber that I'm using for my current project. Now, the first time that I tried to do a fleece to frock, I decided I was going to use black Welsh mountain sheep, very period sheep. They have a beautiful black natural color, and it's just really, really beautiful. So I decided I was going to make a 14th century uh, coat hardy, and it was going to be something that went over a normal dress, so kind of like an outerwear, because black Welsh is a little bit of a rough, a little bit of a rough fiber. So I got a fleece. It's about a four pound fleece and I was like, okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to jump in. I did not do research up front. I was a, I'd been spinning maybe four or five years. I started spinning and I wove it up. And then I realized that when I was done, I had four yards of 18 inch wide fabric and that was nowhere near enough to make a dress. So I bought another fleece from a different vendor and spun it up. And the quality was just so different. It, it looked like two different types of fabric. So I couldn't use it. So instead, I, you know, chalked it up to what not to do and made a hood. It's a beautiful hood now. So when you're going to do a project and you have to use more than one fleece, you need to buy all the fleeces up front. And then you need to mix them together before you comb them or card them or whatever you're going to do so that it, it's homogeneous before you start. You can't do one fleece at a time. And even if you're going to get a fleece from the same sheep, like the next year, 
year to year, you can have a completely different quality fleece from the same sheep because of diet or sickness or weather. There's so many variables that affect a fleece and the chances of you getting a fleece from the exact same sheep is very low. So definitely, you know, get as much as you need up front, and we'll talk about that later, how you can go about calculating how much you need. You're going to need to do sampling and uh, do a little bit of math, and you can figure all that out. So I, this picture here is about probably six or seven fleeces that I've collected over time, and then I felt I had enough, and then I started going to the next step of processing. But uh, fiber choice is very important, and uh, you want to do research about what you're going to be able to get available to you. Uh, before you commit to a certain a certain type of fiber. So now you've decided on your fiber, how are you going to clean it? Or are you going to clean it at all? Some people decide not to clean their own fiber. You can send it out to be cleaned or you can buy something that's already processed. Um, it's, it's up to you how much you want to do. It's very hard if you have, uh, if you live in an apartment or you have a very small area to work in to clean your own your own fiber. I don't do it the period way. I clean my fiber with modern methods. I don't have the space to clean with urine um, or have big, you know, boiling pots. So I do it, I do it in my bathtub with modern detergent. Um, so you have to determine how you're going to clean it, what materials you will need, what equipment you'll need, and what space you're going to have available to do the cleaning. Here are some examples of my method for washing. So this is what I would put in my documentation. On the left-hand side, I have my raw fleece in laundry bags. This is so the, the wool doesn't move around so much, so it doesn't really felt when I'm, or hopefully doesn't felt while I'm washing it. I soak it in buckets with really hot water, and uh, I use unicorn scour. I've also used Dawn, the blue uh, Dawn dish liquid and I soak it until I get most of the dirt and grease out of it, and then I do it with clear water, and then I dry it downstairs in my basement on drying racks. I have a dehumidifier downstairs. This also in the basement keeps my cats out of it, and it's it's clean and it's it's dry downstairs. If I was to do it outside, I would have to secure it so that the squirrels and the birds didn't take it for nests. So again, you know, you decide what works best for you. You can uh, do it. Some people do it in a washing machine, um, and then you know that's another another option. You just have to determine how you're going to do it and document how it's different from the way it medievally would be done. Here are some pictures of my current project and how I'm preparing the fiber. So up in the right upper right. Those are the combs that I'm using and the basket that I collect the combed fiber in. I've done some research and um, some, of the, some of the prep was done by greasing up the combs. They would dunk their combs in like oil or fat um, and warm it up. So I read a, a modern article from the spinoff magazine where the uh, fiber artist talked about spraying her fleece with a mixture of water and olive oil. So that's what I'm doing here. So the middle picture is a spray bottle with just water in it. And then on the upper left is a spray bottle with olive oil in it. Um, and so I sprayed a little bit. And then on the bottom left is me combing it. And it did make it much easier to, uh, to comb and get through the combs. And also when you're pulling it off the, pulling it off the combs when you're done. So this is um, the Jacob fleece where I'm mixing the brown and the white together and getting the gray. So you can... You can kind of see how, um, you know, up in the top pictures, how you can see how it's brown and white. But then after I'm done combing it, it's a really nice gray color. So I'm really pleased with the way this is coming out. In the bottom right-hand corner, that's the finished, the finished wool after it's been taken off the combs. So now that you've decided how you're going to prep your fiber, how are you going to spin it? Choose the equipment for spinning. Are you going to use a wheel? You're going to use a drop spindle. You're going to use a combination. I often, for a big project like this, if I'm doing a dress, I will often use my wheel 
and then also do some on the drop spindle and keep samples of both. Um, so if I'm doing a display, I'll put out both the wheel spun singles and plied um, and the drop spindle so that people can see for themselves if there's any difference. Another thing that I like to do is have a little magnifying glass so people can look up close at it. Um, I'm not worried too much uh, about the differences. It's to me, it's it's pretty much even enough that if I do the wheel and the drop spindle, once I weave it, you won't be able to tell, oh, there's a spot where it was drop spun. Um, what weight do you want your finished yarn to be? How many plies do you want your finished yarn to be? Do you want two, four, three, or singles? What I'm going to be doing now is because I want to do a, a fine fabric, a fine wool fabric, lightweight, I'm going to do singles. Um, and that's a challenge that comes with a whole bunch of other things. So I'm doing spin singles. Um, how many wraps per inch do you want for the single? And if you're going to ply it, how many wraps per inch do you want for the plied yarn? In what direction are you going to spin your singles? And in what direction are you going to ply if you're going to ply? And what is the process, if any, for setting your twist? These are all things that you should think of. And this might involve some sampling. You may want to, at this point, if you have fiber, um, try it and see what the different weights give you. And uh, it may be trial and error and save everything. Save sample, all the samples that you did. Um, if you're going to be doing a final um, arts and science presentation, um, it's always good for people to see your process and to be able to talk about it. Here are some pictures of me spinning for the various projects. On the left hand side, um, if you look at the on the lower corner, you can see the bobbins I'm plying Black Welsh Mountain Sheep. So this was that project and I'm using my ladybug wheel. Um, so it was it was pretty it was as fine as I could get it, but not as fine as I would have liked it to be. Um, and so that was that in the center. This is the gray fiber that I that you saw earlier that I combed for my current project. And this is just going to be a single. So there's no plying. I'm going to spin the warp and the weft in different directions so that when it's woven together, they kind of go into each other a little bit. I'm going to give that a try. And then on the all the way right side, this is me spinning Black Welsh on a drop spindle at a timeline event that I did with the Holy Kingdom of Acker, where it was Roman time period all the way up through World War II. So we're in front of some old vintage trucks there. And I was it was kind of interesting because I was showing people how spinning doesn't really change. So even though I was a medieval spinner, it's still basically the same thing. So that was pictures from that. So now if you're going to dye your your final uh, fiber, uh, if you're going to use natural dyes, what is your mordant going to be? What will the ratio dye to fabric be? What dye will be used? And what is the quantity of dye to, fi to fiber? You definitely want to keep track of this if you're going to need to replicate it, um, especially if you're not doing it all at once. But you want to do figure all this stuff out ahead of time and like everything else, know that you have the right equipment and everything. The current thing that I'm doing right now, I won't be dying. So I would just skip this when I'm doing my project checklist. Here are some pictures of uh, fiber that I have dyed beforehand. Um, so up in the upper left hand side, this is some uh, synthetic dye that's used for cotton and so this is just i bought from dharma and uh in the center is some the dried dye getting uh diluted into water on the bottom left this is a dye pot this is i think this might have been with natural dyes and i have my little thermometer in there to keep track of the temperature of the water and then in the bottom right corner this is three different skeins, might be more, but I think it's just three skeins of embroidery floss that I had spun. And then I dyed it in the same pot, one skein after another, so I would get a gradient effect. Um, so that was a, a separate project. And, you know, I needed to keep track of my ratios and the mordant and all that stuff. So now we're thinking about weaving. If you're going to weave, um, and this for me, weaving 
is the is the step I have the least amount of experience for. So this is something that's always a challenge for me, it takes a little bit of extra uh, research. And also I, I tend to reach out to people that I know that have more experience with weaving um, for equipment and, and tips and tricks for this. So if you're gonna be weaving, what equipment will you be using? Uh, what weave will you use? What what are you using for your warp and what are you using for your weft? As I said before, I'm going to spin my warp and weft in different directions. So I have to determine which is which. Um, and I think the, if I remember correctly, the extant piece I have has that information in it. So it's not even something that I have to determine. I'm going to do it just the way my extant piece had. Um, but if you don't have an extant piece or it doesn't indicate that, you know, are you going, some people prefer to buy, uh, you know, store-bought, yarn for their warp. These are all decisions you should make beforehand. Also when weaving, how much uh, width, what is the fabric width and length will you need to make? And how much yardage will you need of overall fabric? And then will you be using sizing on your warp thread? An important thing, something I'm struggling with now, I'm having a hard time finding documentation of warp sizing that was used. I have some anecdotal evidence and um, you know, just people saying, oh, they use this, they use that, but I have not been able to find the documentation. So that's something that I'm still still researching, but I haven't gotten there in my pro process yet. So that's good. So this, for this weaving example, this was uh, for that Welsh event that I told you about. We wanted to do a sheep to shawl so we could have some period spinning going on um, in addition to the other games and, and stuff that was going on. So I decided I would spin the warp ahead of time to save time. And at the event, we would have the fiber and everybody would just spin the weft. And then it wouldn't matter so much how thick it was. Um, I found a really great Welsh mountain sheep. It was a badger face Welsh mountain sheep. And I spun up my, my warp threads um, just however, you know, the thickness that I, I thought it would be. And again, remember, I don't have a lot of weaving experience and I wanted it to be a single because I knew my next project, I would be using singles for the, for the warp. So I wanted to give that a try. Did not put sizing on the warp, got to the event, decided I would warp it so that everybody could see how I would do it. And it was impossible to warp, to warp the, the loom because because there was no sizing in it, and this is a kind of a bouncy yarn, every time I would pull it through a slot or a loop, it would just bing, spring back up, and it would just knot up with everything else. And I would get something straightened out, and then the next one, and it was, it just didn't happen. So we just finished, we just spun, we combed and spun and hung out. And then when I came home, I was determined to get it done. So I put on the left-hand side, you see my, the fiber, the warp, on a warping board and then I used sizing and because I didn't have documentation I used, um, I boiled some flax seeds till I got a nice goop and put it on there, let it dry and then it was nice and stiff and it warped fine. It was excellent. Now the other issue that I have is I only have, at the time I only had a rigid heddle. So there's only uh, so fine you could get the, get the reed for a, a rigid heddle. So it was not fine enough. And as you see all the way on the right side, for what I spun, it was too much of an open weave. It was not attractive at all. And I was just tired of working on this and I just decided to scrap the whole thing. Um, it was, you know, a, an exercise in how to do it. I learned a lot. I, I did document it so that, you know, I like to show my mistakes so that other people can learn from it, especially me. So hopefully the next time I do it, um, if I don't have another loom to use, I will spin the warp thicker and then we'll indicate how, how thick we should spin the, the weft um, for the people there and I definitely size the warp. So that's, that's a what not to do, uh, but I've learned from the experience, so I can't, I can't be too sad about it. And we had a lot of fun, so good times. Maybe you're not gonna be weaving at all. Maybe you're going to be knitting or doing spraying or doing embroidery. You can change the checklist for however you're going to you know, do your process. You should use that as a living document and change it however you need it. But if you're going to be knitting, you'll need to think about what needles will you use? Um, what 
is your stitch per inch that you're going for? What tools will you need to complete your knitting? What is the pattern that you're gonna use? Are you making the pattern up? Is it based on an extant piece? Again, is it someone else's pattern that they've done the research on? And how much yardage will you need for the knitting? Which again, that's gonna be sampling. You're gonna to have to sample with all the, the dimensions that you've already decided on and, and try and calculate how much that you need. The next step would be deciding if you want to full your, your fabric. Um, will you full it after weaving or after you're done sewing it? Will you be fulling by hand or by machine? What materials and equipment will you require and where will you be doing it? Um, the first project that I did, the Black Welsh, it was just a, a regular up down tabby weave. So I decided I was gonna full it which add, you know, shrinks the fabric down. So you're gonna have to sample it to determine that. You're gonna need to, to put more yardage into it. The project that I'm doing right now, I'm not gonna full it because I think it'll, it'll I want the, uh, the color work to be more crisp. And if I full it, that'll kind of make it fuzzy. So I've decided not to do that with this one. Then when it, you have your fabric all planned out, how are you going to cut and sew your garment? Uh, where, where will your pattern come from? Will you do a mock-up first? I highly recommend that you do a mock-up first because maybe the first time that you fit the garment to you is not with the fabric that took you maybe over 100 hours to make. You want to use some scrap fabric or some muslin or something inexpensive. Um, will you sew it by hand? Will you sew your garment by machine? Will you do a combination? What stitches will you use? If you're going to do it by hand, you know, you research the stitches that you'll use to make sure they're period to your time period. Um, what, how will you hem your garment? Uh, what materials will be used? What thread, needles, pins, anything that you would, that you would be using? Um, the benefit, if you're going to be using wool, you can use the same, uh, you can spin just extra wool and use that for your hand sewing. And then over time, it'll kind of felt and, and make a stronger bond with the garment. Here are some examples uh, that I've uh, used for documenting cutting and sewing techniques. On the left-hand side is a cloak I was making for Mistress Karras's elevation. Um, even though it was not getting entered into an arts and science competition, when I do something like that uh, for a friend, if I have done uh, if I have done research and it's trying to emulate something period, I will often take pictures of the process and all the, the resources and the extant pieces or the illustrations that I use, the illuminations, and then I gave it to her in a little folder so she can have all that information and see how the process came about because, you know, it was all happening behind the scenes um, and she didn't know. So um, on the right hand side is a picture I took for a tutorial that I was doing for how to do kind of like a, a rolled hem that's not really a rolled hem, it's kind of like a cheat way of doing it. So that was just pictures that I, I took for the PDF tutorial. Um, so that's just an example. Embellishments. Once your garment is all finished, there might be some embellishments that you have to decide. Does your garment require closures? How will you do the closures? Will there be trim or hand embroidered elements? What will be on your head? Will you use a veil, a hat, loose hair? Just, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, get that all figured out ahead of time. Here's some embroidery that I did with hand, in, hand spun silk. It was a two ply silk. Um, this was for the Baron Eric Leclerc of the Setmore Swamp for his investiture, I did this on a tunic. And I did a lot of sampling because I had my design ideas, but I wasn't sure what he wanted and he wasn't really sure. So I used some purchased embroidery floss and then I had some hand spun. Some of it was done in color. Then this white on white was done. And then he decided he liked the white on white better and what elements. And this is another, uh, Another point in favor of sampling, because sometimes it's not just for your own benefit to see if you're using the right thickness and the right pattern. Um, but if you're trying to 
get a decision from someone who's not a fiber person, it's some, it's sometimes hard for you to explain it. They need to see it. And that was an example where we needed to do it. So um, I wish I had, I when I did this, I did it with silk that I had already spun and I just had it and I did it. Um, if I was going back and do it again, I would have spun specifically for this project because uh, the it wasn't plied tight enough for my liking to use an embroidery. So once you start working on the project, where would you capture your information? Very important because if you do all this research and all this documentation, but you don't have it organized, it'll just make the, pro the whole process much more difficult and you won't be very happy about it. So you can use a computer, you can have a journal or a notebook, you can have a folder with loose paper, you can put it all in a box, and uh, you can use a combination. I wind up doing a combination. Usually I start off my checklist and uh, an outline of my documentation is always on the computer. And then I'll journal and notebook as I'm working on something. I'll keep the journal you know, next to my work area, next to my wheel, um, so I can jot down notes as I'm going. I have a folder with information that I gather, um, a box you know, for other loose things. And don't forget to keep a list of your sources. That is the most important thing, because if you're using a book from the library or you borrowed a book, or even if it's taking it off your shelf, then it goes back on the shelf. A year or two later, you're not going to remember what your source was and what it all kind of blends together. So here is a picture of my binder. I tend to use the binder for every project. So this is for the current fleece to frock pod project that I'm working on now. So I just bought inexpensive binders at Staples. And then I start off with the extant pictures that I showed you earlier of what the whole project is going off of. Um, also in the front will be my checklist. So the checklist will be there and I'll always can refer to it as I'm working on the project. Then I have, um, because I'm a little old school and back when I was in college and had to do research papers, didn't do it on the computer, so I would photocopy in the library. I just have a habit of still doing that, of taking the photocopy, and then if it's not shown on the page, write down what book and what page it came from. So it's there, and I can reread it, because sometimes, you know, if you take a note, you want to reread it in its context to get the whole, the whole information. Um, in the lower left corner, I have photographs, uh, sketches from a book on period spindles that would be used in my time period and area. So I'm gonna try and spin at least some of this project on spindles that look like that, which I, I have. Um, and then the next uh, picture is, I like to handwrite notes when I'm reading. I just take notes another, you know, just old school way of how I'm used to doing research. Then this next picture is, I put into some plastic sheets the documentation that I picked up from the different breeders as I was getting Jacob. And then, you know, of course I check this because sometimes the breeders all get it from the same information or they're giving anecdotal stuff. So it's just a jumping off point uh, to look up more information. And then all the way on the right, this is just some miscellaneous pictures. The thing in the back, I think, is when I was doing an arts and science competition. It's like a tent uh, display with my name on it in my kingdom that can come in useful for more displays. I have a postcard that has a picture of an illumination on it that has pictures of a loom and spinning and I think card carding. So, you know, it gives some, some pictures of that. So I keep all this. And then when the project's over, if I do documentation write up, that goes in there too. And then I keep the binder. And so then when I, w before I did the fleece to fiber two, Fabric 2 one, um, I went back and looked at the first one, all my documentation, to look at what went wrong, what worked well, um, the information I had gathered from that. A lot of times, one project is a jumping off point for another project, so it's always helpful to have that. I mean, in doing this project, I've thought of at least two or three other projects that I want to do based on what I learned from this one. So it'll be good to have that original information that I kept for this always on hand.
So another thing you should do when you're working on a project is talk to other people about what you're working on. Discuss your project with friends, mentors, and arts and science consultation tables, other artisans experience in that area. Um, you never know where you're gonna find information and inspiration. Um, one of the sheep breeds that I found, uh, the Middle Eastern sheep Karkakal, um, it was a period cook of a friend of mine who was looking for fat-tailed sheep that he could use in recipes. And he asked me if I had known about the sheep and I didn't. So then I started studying it. And so we both found a new sheep together. Um, another friend of mine who's also um, a cook, I was asking, telling them I was having a hard time finding the information for warp sizing. And she suggested I look in farm manuals because the manuals she was looking in for recipes, they also have uh, directions for how you would do household items like that. So it might have information. That made me also think about housewifery books I have um, that I didn't think to look in. So that's, you know, it's good information. Also, um, my aunt a couple of months ago sent me a book that she it had to do with, you know, fleece to finish yarn. And she's like, you're always talking about this. I thought you'd like this book. And it was a great book that I had never heard of before. So, you know, oh, talk, you never know where the next uh, bit of information is going to come from. Um, you also may be able to borrow tools or books that help you in your project or point you to appropriate vendors. Um, so there's my apprentice sister and I want to do some flax processing, but we don't want to do a whole field full of flax. We just want to do it a little bit to have the experience. I don't want to buy or make all the equipment I would need to um, to process flax. That's a lot of time and effort and money to do just, you know, a couple of stalks. So she knows of a farm somewhere where you can go and you can, you know, for the day just work on it so that's great that she had that information and we'll eventually go and do that and we'll take pictures we have we'll have gone through it without having to put in all the time and effort to make all that equipment um also talking to other people they can help you avoid pitfalls and will help you um if it when it comes to proofreading so if you need someone to look over what you're doing but the pitfalls i mean hopefully you're getting a lot of the things that i did wrong um, then you won't do it. You won't do make the same mistake. So it's always a good idea, I think, to talk to other people about what you're working on. And then once you have your project all done, you have your final, you know, your final fabric, um, you know, garment, share it with everybody that's kind of what the sca is all about is all of us doing this research it's it's for our own knowledge but then to share it with other people even if you're not planning on making it an arts and science display entry or a competition entry um you can still help other people with your knowledge you can just post it on social media let people see what you're doing and then they can ask you questions maybe they've been trying to do it or they've always wanted to do that and they'll reach out to you and find out how you did it. Um, post it to a blog if you have a blog. Um, make a tutorial PDF. Now, on Facebook, I belong to the Setmore Swamp Facebook group, and I'm in the Kingdom of Acker, and our Facebook group, they have a section where you can put PDFs on there in the files so people put up their tutorials for having to do something, and that's a great resource. When a new person joins up, we point them over there so they can see how to make a whole bunch of different stuff. And it's a great jumping off point. So, you know, that's just a great way to share. And if someone asks you, how do you do that? You have a tutorial already written up that you can give, or if you're gonna teach a class, it's a great thing to have. Also, you can teach a formal or informal class. Um, at Penzik, there's Penzik University. And for many years, I enjoyed taking all the classes at Penzik University. And then I felt, you know, I really should be giving back. It's great that so many people offer offer their talents. I was really nervous about doing it, but once I, I did it, I found it was it was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, and your information really is useful to somebody else. No matter what it is that you do, there's always a unique take that you have, and it will really help educate someone else. So I encourage you to take that leap and, and teach. And if not, at Pensac at an event. Um, at a Shire or Barony meeting or gathering, sometimes 
in the Sentmore Swamp, we do small group uh, gatherings. We call it a swamp stomp and it's like garb optional and we just hang out and potluck and, and you know, I've taught classes there and just informally or at an artisan's row. That's another great thing that we've been doing lately at Mudthaw and different events where we just have people just working on their craft and doing whatever they do and people can come and ask them questions. It's a fantastic informal way for people to discuss and um or now we have we have zooms and even even though you know we're starting to do in person i think the zooms are going to stick a, around a while because i've taken some really great university classes from all the different kingdoms so hopefully that'll still be made available because different regions teams seem to have different uh arts going on and it's just great to see i know especially for fiber different different fiber animals or different fiber plants in the different areas are popular so it's just it's been great and i think that's going to stick around so you know you can always reach out to me and ask me i had to record this no kidding like five or six times hopefully this is the last time so i've made a lot of mistakes here too i'm happy to share with you um you can also publish you can publish in your baronial or shire newsletter i know our newsletters are always hurting for articles it doesn't have to be a long write-up it could just be um you know here's a picture of a dress i made you know and this is this is what i started with i started with this sheep and it could be a simple little thing um tournaments illuminated also always looking for articles and um the complete anachronist which i mentioned i had done and the editors of of those two will help you through you talk to them first and see if they're interested in what you've done and most likely they will say yes and uh, they will talk to you about what is required and they had i had to completely change how i had done my bibliography and documentation for the complete anachronist and um the editor was just fantastic and they had proofreaders and it it like i said before if i was doing something with that in mind it would go much easier now that i know how it all is supposed to be done but they were just uh fantastic with helping get my my documentation to where it needed to be so definitely reach out and you'll be surprised and amazed at how interested other people are in what you're doing here are some resources um that hopefully you can, you know, you might find useful. The first is the Fleece and Fiber Source Book by Deb, Deborah Robson and Carol Icarius. Um, so this book is is fantastic. I mean, modern spinners use it in medieval spinners. It's got tons, over 200 different uh, animal breeds, mostly sheep, where they come from, what their fiber looks like, just all this great information. It's a fantastic jumping off point if you're doing your own research. Um, and it, it helps the, you know, they say where they got their information from. So it's a really great resource. And then, um, there's the complete anachronist that I, that, you know, I've discussed that I did. Um, and you can get that on the SCA website and it has the more period breeds that I've done and the hemp and linen and flax. And I've, it's geared more towards beginners. That was another thing that we changed with when it became a complete anachronist and it also has some ideas for what you can do with the fiber some uses um so again use it as a jumping off point to do your own research but it's it's just a starting thing so you're not starting from square one some other uh video resources that i found helpful there's a video three bags full by judith mckenzie um and this video is is about how to purchase separate store clean and spin a raw fleece I wish I had seen this before I started buying fleeces on my own because I really didn't know what I was looking for with a good fleece. Um, especially if you're buying a dirty fleece, it looks dirty when you start, but there are things you can do to check to make sure you're getting a good quality. Um, and this is on the Long Thread Media website. They, you should still be able to get it there and possibly you might be able to find it uh, if you have a local fiber uh, resource seller. Um, hand spinning rare wools, how to spin them and why we should care. This is also by Deborah Robson. It was the companion video for the fleece and fiber source book. Um, she doesn't, not all of the fibers that are spun in that are def, are only medieval fibers, but the thing that's really helpful is she goes through her process of determining what's the right 
tool to use for different fibers. And she'll say, oh, I carded this, I didn't like this, so I combed it. Um, and it really is good for the process. And a lot of the medieval breeds are considered rare. There's only like one or two, like Shetland comes to mind uh, as, you know, you can find Shetland anywhere, but most medieval breeds are harder to find and would be considered rare. So it's a useful video if you come across it. Some websites that you might find helpful, uh, Long Thread Media, that is, they, they publish the magazine spin-off, Handwoven, Piecework, and some other uh, handcrafty magazines. And it's mostly for the modern crafter, but especially Piecework, they do a lot of historical work. And for spinning, didn't really change that much um, until you, know, you got into the machines using it. So there's some really interesting, I found things on period breeds and, and different techniques that you know, were go back to medieval times. So it's it's something a resource. Then there's also Ravelry, which is a social network for knitters and crocheters and hand spinners and weavers. And there's different forum boards for different groups. And there's a lot of historical textile workers and a lot of people in the SEA that work with fibers there. I'm not on there as much as I used to be, but you can find me there as Foxy Fiber Check. So if you message me, I'll I'll eventually get it. And uh, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll, I always say, oh, I'm going to be more active, active, but there's a lot of great resources there and patterns and people who have done a lot of work, people who make their own tools. It's just you can find a lot of great resources there and a lot of people just sharing their knowledge. So here's my contact information. Um, medievally, I'm Vivian de Dunbar. My Monday name is Heather Fox, and you can email me at craftynara at gmail.com. And my Facebook is Heather Castelli Fox. And on Ravelry, like I said, I'm Foxy Fiber Chick. I, I encourage you to seek me out and uh, I'm happy to talk about whatever you're working on. I love talking about fiber and I love hearing what other people are doing. And hopefully, you know, before too long, knock on wood, we're gonna be able to be in person and sharing our fiber and feeling our fibers together. And I look forward to that. And uh, please look at the handouts that I have that for the, um, I gave you some arts and science questions, some standard questions is the one handout and the other handout is a checklist. And, you know, use them however, however you see fit. And I hope it helps you. And if you have any questions, reach out to me. And in the meantime, enjoy the rest of university and please be kind to each other. Bye.